Good morning and welcome to Summit Community Church. We're glad you're here to worship with us online and YouTube. And the folks here are ready to worship as well. Let's stand and sing together a great old hymn, All Praise to Thee.
place it doesn't matter where we worship it's what your son told us whether it's here or in Jerusalem or in the middle of the ocean on high on a mountaintop we can see you because you are with us as we're looking to try to find your worship place your worship place is within us that's where you dwell therefore we can worship wherever we are we are not restricted to wait till we find a church building. Father, you are at home in our hearts and we gratefully acknowledge your presence today. We thank you and we worship you. Show us who we really are. In your son's holy and precious name, amen. Be seated. Well, we had a lot of activity this week. Uh, you can't see it online, but we have the railing up out front of the church, and it looks beautiful. I think it looks great. Terry told me it fits just perfect. She didn't know that we took some measurements while she was sleeping and uh, got it just, just the right height. 
Um, Dan says it, it's it's just just perfect. So it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, it is a lot of fun. In fact, I'm going to have to put a sign out there for the skateboarders that I've already seen the skateboard yeah. marks out there and the bicycle oh. marks. Yeah. <laughs> so we got to put some signs up. Maybe the rails will keep them. Of course, they like to jump on the rails, so that's probably not. Oh. So we'll have to we'll have to we'll have to put a sign up and say please please you don't. Know, there's a camp, a hunting camp. Mm -hmm. I think we should put it up. It does. I've already had it up briefly, and it works. But when we brought the material inside, we didn't feel like we needed it. So over here, um, you'll see that we have some uh, tongue groove uh, knotty pine material that's been laid out in the church. And the reason we put it in here is that material does not work well in sunshine. So we needed to get it inside and stack it up nicely so that it will stay flat and straight, and uh, it won't be too difficult to, to hang if it dries a little bit it won't twist so could you put a gate on in front of that you know with this swinging gate oh uh, we could yeah yeah, yeah we probably come could come in not a bad idea you bet or a clothesline <laughs> that's just that's just the ornery guy in me I'm sorry. Um, that would not be a good witness yes no that would not be a good witness so, um, so we're gonna we're gonna have this sitting here for a while until we get the roof completed. Um, the good news is we were up here Friday, and uh, uh, CC and myself and some others were were putting the the final touches on getting the roof completely sealed, so it's watertight now. So we're no longer in any concern of rain. If it comes, we will be watertight. No damage will come. So that's ready to go. We're gonna start chipping away. Um, we were thinking that maybe we would do metal roof on. The new section however after pricing metal and pricing regular shingles and then discussing the different appearance we decided uh, this week that it would probably be better to go ahead with composition shingles on the on the new part uh, which is the the, yeah, the, sure. the gable roof there and then we're gonna uh, on the lower section I think we're gonna have to do a flat roof it's just not gonna work with shingles or metal in that area so we're probably gonna have to put some uh, uh, membrane down and then do some uh, tar on top of that so it'll be a flat roof and that'll be the best protection for that area so we're working on getting those materials now so more money but uh, <laughs> we'll just keep doing it till we're done <laughs> yeah and then we can begin to work on underneath and, and beautifying the whole thing we're gonna put that knotty pine up underneath it and stain that uh, the same color as we're going to stain the, 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 the beams that you see. So everything will be very attractive. Then we're going to finish it off with some nice uh, trim and railings. Uh, any of the metal that you see will be encapsulated with some black uh, iron is the plan, some wrought iron. I'm having a guy forge some up for us, some custom pieces. So, um, uh, well, we actually, there's a couple of things. There's one other thing we have to do. We actually had an inspection this week uh, and we did not pass. And the reason is where the railing ends on that side, we don't have it landscaped yet. The plans call for landscaping to come right up to it. So technically Dan could like fall off and roll down that hill. Um, so they said, well, no, nope, you're gonna have to do something here, but they're gonna allow us to put a curb there, a metal curb. So it's just a, a long piece of metal, um, yay big that we could put up like a curb to keep anything from that hits it would be stopped. So, um, and we'll have that powder coated to match and everything. So uh, that, that's, we've got to get that done before we can get our final approval. Um, so that's just waiting to hear back this week on the size of the curb that I need to get. So then we'll be approved final. We won't have any more inspections after that. There's no roof inspection. There's just uh, framing and all that. So yeah, we're in good shape. Oh, and thank you for the folks here for putting that in so I can get in. You betcha. Wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't have it any other way. Yeah, we're, we're covered now with two handicap ramps, uh, two ADA ramps that yeah. are both, both actually are uh, according to specs so that you can use either one and be totally good. So, And we've got one more thing we need to do. We need to work on the building in the back that's kind of tilted at the base. So we're going to work on that before the snow flies also. So we've still got a lot of work to do. So uh, hang in there. We also had our first uh, cleaning from Tanya at the church and we're starting to pay her $100 a month to clean the church. So that's working out. 
All right, so uh, Bible studies are back in business this week. Wednesday Bible study at 1 o'clock, and then Thursday Bible study at 2 o'clock is back on this week. Okay, great. Um, any other announcements that you need to make? Okay. Um, let's go to our time of prayer. Uh, we've had uh, uh, just a couple of uh, folks that we've been praying for. Of course, we've been praying for uh, the family, uh, Dee Dee's family, her son, John, and his two daughters, Chloe and Bethany. Uh, Chloe and Bethany, uh, their mother was killed uh, a couple of weeks ago and uh, don't have any real updates on that. We just need to be praying for them. The grief process is going to be hard, so let's be praying for their, their uh, grief and just pray for God to be present in the midst of it, that they can know him and, and uh, there won't be always satisfying answers but uh grief is just the t time you just got to go through and then be, be pay, praying for that family and also be praying for um the covid resurgence we've got full hospitals katie had it last week she's going back to work tomorrow so and we all tested negative wow. so we're all in the clear um but be praying for that family uh, yes, for, for all the folks with covid resurgence also uh Practice safe distancing after church today. Make sure that you no hugging as much as we want to. No hugging and stay separated and keep your masks on. And then uh, we have Tracy. Her tumor is shrunk. We're celebrating that, but she's still fighting the illness that comes in the, the lethargy that uh, comes with losing energy from the cancer medication. So be praying for Tracy. And Dean, has, uh, his health has declined quite dramatically. I got a call from or a text from his daughter, Kelly, and she wanted us to know that, that he's going to be placed on hospice care. So I told her we would be praying for Dean. And uh, he's, he's not doing real well. Also be praying for Rebecca Hayward. She's been diagnosed with breast cancer. And Frank had a bone cancer diagnosis, but he's feeling okay. And, yeah. And uh, Queen is going to come back here at the end of September, it looks like, for a few weeks. And uh, we also want to be praying for the people of Afghanistan and the horrible tragedy that is unfolding there. Um, just pray for the people that you know, can get out to get out. That's that's kind of the long and short of it. It's kind of hard to kind of hard to feel bad about that because you know the worst case scenario that you jump on a bus to go to heaven. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so let's pray also for those fighting cancer, Tracy and Frank, Rebecca. Francis Moliner, Jim Kraft, Marlene and Terry Rennie, Beth Barnes, David Winters, and Sherry LeDure. Are there any other prayer requests that you bring today? Yes, Kathy. My friend Lulu had passed away. Um, she was in UPF. Um, she had cancer. She was in the hospital for three months. Her daughter married a man from Cuba. He escaped from Cuba, Cuba um, in his early 20s by swimming to Guantanamo from Cuba, four miles in the ocean. He's one of my heroes. But his sister and two nieces were murdered mm. while we were up there. And they were in Houston. But anyhow, that just breaks my heart. They just had grief upon grief in that family. The, the father and two nieces? No, he's, he's okay. But his sister and two nieces. Sister and two nieces. And that was husband. Martha and Alex, yes. and they're in Alaska. They're in Alaska right now, but they'll be going back to the Okay. okay. And, okay. Any other prayer requests? Go, to Lord, in prayer. We thank you, Lord, and we're saddened by the tragedy we just heard about, but we know that you have overcome this world, and we pray that you would help us to overcome. We thank you, Father, for the victory that we have in you, and I pray, Father, that you would reveal to us who we really are in this series that we're studying uh, in John 4, Lord. You make it clear that who we, who we see ourselves to be, Father, could great, we could be greatly limited if we don't see ourselves as you see us. Father, we could move mountains if we simply understand our true identity in Christ and the faith that empowers us 
We can do anything. We can overcome. We can receive the victory. It is an amazing thing, Father, that you empower us on this earth, even here, Lord, to be able to overcome because you have overcome this world. We pray for this family of Lulu Kelly, for her grandchildren and um, uh, the, the husband, sister, and two nieces who were murdered. We just pray for their family in, in their grief and the tragedy that has befallen them. We pray that you would help the family to pull together and know your presence even in the midst of just a horrible time. And we also pray, Father, for, for Dee Dee's son, John, and his two daughters, Chloe and Bethany. In a similar situation, Father, we just pray for them as they mourn the loss of, of uh, the girl's mother. We pray that you might be with her family and strengthen them and help them not just to seek understanding because there probably is nothing to understand here, Lord. There is just simply a need to endure the pain of, of loss. Pray that you would help them to find your presence in the midst of it, that they will find you faithful because they are faithful to seek you. Father, I pray that you would also be with uh, those in our church who are dealing with illness for Tracy and Frank and Rebecca Hayward. We just pray for them today and lift them up to you, along with all the folks that are dealing with cancer for uh, Francis Moliner, Jim Kraft, Marlene and Terry Rennie, Beth Barnes, David Winters, and Sherry Ledoux. I pray that you would just, Father, just hold them all in your hands and embrace them for the long struggle that we have oftentimes with cancer. Encourage them. And prepare them for a long battle, but Father, also encourage their heart in the midst of it, that they might be true worshipers, even in the midst of uh, fighting this cancer. <clears throat> Father, we pray today for uh, those that are dealing with COVID. Uh, so many people have filled our hospitals, and we pray for the doctors, the nurses who are caring for people, but we also pray for all the patients that, Father, you might give the, uh, the bo their bodies strength to fight off the virus, and they would be, regain strength, and we just pray that you would help our uh, our government to figure out the best way to proceed and give us wisdom as we uh, seek to isolate the virus and not spread it. Father, we also ask for your blessing for, on uh, Dean Hager, our friend who is dealing with <coughs> dementia. And we are sad to hear that he's on hospice care, but we also know, Lord, that he is not sad, that he is ready to come home to you. Pray for mercy and that you would uh, bring him home to your presence, that he would be reunited with his wife and with you. Father, we also pray today for um, the people of Afghanistan. We know the tragedy that has befallen them with the takeover by the Taliban. We just pray that you would protect people, that find the hands of the strong man, people that pose as spiritual people, but who are just murderers and thugs. We pray that you would just convict them of their the sin in their heart, the darkness and the hatred, the violence. Help them to understand, Lord, that they will face judgment. Father, we pray for safety. And for those that are evacuating, we pray for uh, a good result that they would be able to get out in time. Father, we ask your blessing upon our whole country as we uh, seek in this season to adjust to life in a new world, a life that in a world that seems to be falling apart, Lord, but we know that you have everything under control. So let us understand what is happening only so much as it helps us to be close to you. We thank you, Father, for what you're doing in our lives and in our midst, and we pray that you would help us today as we study your word. And now as we take the offering, Father, we pray that you bless the gift as well as the giver as we use your tithes and offerings for your glory. In Jesus' name.
just as you are. Hear the Spirit call. Come just as you until we are completely healed, until we're completely sin-free, or completely transformed, you say, come as you are. I will take care of that. If you will receive us, why will we not come? I believe, Father, that we don't know who we are. We think that we are our own, and yet we belong to you. We are your children. Help us to see our true identity in you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you. We've been studying the story of the woman at the well, which followed the story of Nicodemus. Uh, the woman at the well is one of the most well-known stories, narrative stories in the scriptures. Uh, it's been uh, demonstrated over and over and over again uh, how important this passage is. It comes early in Jesus' ministry, and it, it is so revealing of Jesus' method of helping people to understand who he was. Keep in mind, Jesus came. He told us why. All of this was revealed in John chapter 3. He told us why he came. He not only told us why he came, he told us God's overall plan. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. He gave his only begotten son so that whosoever would believe in him should have everlasting life. Amen. Everlasting life. That's God's plan. He sent Jesus to us 
so that if we believe in him, we will find everlasting life. Well, that's the story in action. You get to see theoretically what God had planned in chapter three. That's like a, a general telling you the plan. But then the army is sent into battle in chapter four. He says, let's see how it works. Let's see the plan in action. And that's what Jesus is doing. He is going from place to place. He is teaching. He is preaching. He has his 12 disciples to assist him in ministry. He is healing. He is uh, helping people understand. But he's also challenging people who are self-righteous and don't see the need that they have for him. And I'm going to be interspersing from time to time stories that augment what we're trying to point out here with this story, because I am approaching this story differently from the way I've approached it in the past. <clears throat> I have seen, I've discovered what I think is a common thread in uh, many of the encounters that Jesus has. The common thread, when you see something like this, you try to pull on that thread and see where it leads. And the more I pull on it, the more excited I am about what I've, I've learned from studying this passage yet again, because I see so many of the contacts that Jesus has with people more easily understood, more clearly understood in light of what I now realize and somehow I missed before. And that is the common thread of Jesus addressing the identity of the person to whom he's talking. The identity of who he's talking to is very important and it's very important in the way that John also tells the story of each of the encounters that Jesus has. Because the identity is usually an issue. Because Jesus seems to understand who they really are. Who they really were created to be. I'm not talking about what they like and don't like. I'm not talking about their favorite colors. Have you thought about that? What makes you who you are? Is it your personality? Is it your experiences? Is it your desires? Now... Sometimes people are introduced in really strange ways. Uh, there was a musician who uh, was very well known for all the music that he does, but he was speaking to a group of people who were trauma survivors, survivors of, of bad accidents or childhood abuse. So, and um, they introduced this musician with his long resume of music. And he said, he stood up and he says, I know it's customary to thank whoever the introducer is but in this case, I'm afraid you got it all wrong. That's not who I am. I am not defined by my music. I am defined in many different ways, but that is not one of them. That's just something I do. That's not who I am. Who I am, I am here today to tell you I'm just a fellow struggler on this journey. And I really was struck by that. That this famous person doesn't want to be known for what he's famous for. I wonder how many times that happens to people. For the people that win the lottery, do you realize that they'll never be introduced to any other way for the rest of their life except this is the guy that won the lottery? It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter where you've come from. It doesn't matter where you're going. It only matters that you won money. They say, they say that sometimes about Oscar winners when they win an Oscar for the rest of your life. You'll say, Academy Award winner, so-and-so. That's all you want to be known for? That you were an actor? That you weren't even yourself? Well, what is it that makes you you? Who are you really? What makes you who you are? Your identity is really important in this message today. Who you are is of critical importance, as we saw last week with Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a tax collector. And he was an annoying, obnoxious, hated tax collector. He was the worst of the worst. Nobody liked him. Now, we, we went through the story in detail last week, but I think you understand what a tax collector did. They would literally stand at city gates. Sometimes they would have a table and they would make sure that you paid taxes. Here's the problem. 
when they paid their taxes, there was no hard and fast rule. There were some guidelines, but it was greatly open to interpretation, and that's what a tax collector was paid to do. But he was also incentivized to do it by keeping some of the money. You see how he's got a conflict of interest? That's why he was hated. It's like a corrupt public official who's protected by the government. Oh wait, that's what we have. Um, <laughs> just a little joke. So you can see how hated he would be, and yet that's how everybody saw him. He was never ever introduced, except this is Zacchaeus, the tax collector. If he wasn't there, it was there Zacchaeus, that bleepity 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 tax collector. He was not liked. And yet Jesus walks into town and he is surrounded by crowds so much so that Zacchaeus could not even get a glimpse of Jesus as he was coming by. But being the guy that always played the angles, he looked up and saw there's a sycamore tree. I'm going to climb that sycamore tree. And he goes up the tree and he is able from the top of that tree to look down and see from a bird's eye view, unobstructed, Jesus walking through the crowd and all the people around him. And he's sitting there thinking, man, what has he done to be so famous? What is, is he giving out money? Free beer? What's going on with this guy? I mean, you could draw a crowd. But Jesus was just walking. He wasn't giving out money. He wasn't promising anybody anything uh, that was going to make their life a whole lot easier. He was a spiritual teacher. And he was walking through town and Zacchaeus said, this guy has got some major, major clout. If he's got the whole town excited about his coming. And as Jesus walked into this town, Luke tells us that he stopped. And the crowd was around him and they were looking around, all of them trying to get his attention. Jesus, heal my son. Jesus, I've got problems at home with my, my mother-in-law. I, Jesus, I've got problems with my, my withered hand or I've got problems in my health. My children are sick. Jesus, help, help, help. And Jesus turned around and he looked up and he saw Zacchaeus and he said, Zacchaeus. And everybody goes, the entire town and Jesus Christ. We're looking at Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was probably pretty uncomfortable in that moment. Uh-oh. Is he going to read me the riot act for stealing from everyone? You see, they didn't like him because, you know, to, to give you an example, you know, police have a tremendous amount of discretion. They can pull you over, but they don't have to give you a ticket. Sometimes they say they have to. They don't have to. They don't have to. Maybe on your cell phone, I hear sometimes they have to ticket people with cell phones. But I've heard that they have a tremendous amount of discretion. They may ticket you, they may not. And so I'm always, if I ever get pulled over, it's usually for a blinker out or something like that because I never, ever break the law. And, just kidding. Um, but when I get pulled over, I'm just going, oh boy, I hope I get a warning if it's something like I was turning the wrong way or something, you know? I'm always kind of wondering, but once, you know, it becomes clear, if you're going to get a ticket, it's like, eh, this stinks. Your attitude gets a little sour. You may get a little rude. But that officer has all this discretion at his disposal. That's a tax collector. We, our former treasurer, Lori Wilman, was driving through Lapine. She got a ticket for going 22 in a 20 mile an hour zone. She got a ticket for going 22 miles an hour in a 20 zone. That's called a little bit of abuse of discretion. You see, if we ticket everyone that's speeding, we're all going to run out of money quickly. Because we all make mistakes. We all touch the fog line. you got to show discretion. you got that leeway. A tax collector had that kind of discretion. And he could just take as much as he wanted and really leave you hurting. Or he could just kind of, eh, we're good. So nobody liked him. And so when they all looked at him, the eyes turned toward him and they were like, oh, good. I hope he zaps Zacchaeus. If he's a spiritual leader, he knows that that's the worst guy in town. And Jesus looked up and what Jesus was going to say next was very important. What did Jesus say? Come on down, Zacchaeus. 
my friend, I'm going to come to your house and we're going to have supper together. Now, why in the world would Jesus do this? If Jesus was really in to getting a crowd and influencing people, he would say, Zacchaeus, shame on you. Zach. And he'd fall out of the tree dead and lay on the ground. And the whole crowd would go, yes, Jesus, you rock. Yes. He would have pleased the crowd. He would have had everybody so happy. They would have been given money. They would have been saying, hey, wow, I want to follow you. But Jesus said, Zacchaeus, you're my kind of guy. Come right down here and stand next to me. Because we're going to go have dinner together. Mm -hmm. And he showed Zacchaeus not just respect, not just deference. He loved. Zacchaeus in front of this crowd that wanted to hurt Zacchaeus. How would Jesus do that? And what was his point? His point to the crowd was, this man is not who you think he is. He is not the man you think he is. He is not an evil monster. He's lost his way. He doesn't know who he is. He thinks he's a tax collector, but he is a child of God. And so are you. And all of the people. Boy, how do you respond in that situation? You go, you're all excited to see a spiritual teacher. You want to see God. You want to see a miracle. Wow, I don't know what Jesus is going to do. And you walk away going, Zacchaeus, really? Really? But I think what Jesus really wanted to happen was for everyone to question who they saw themselves to be. If Zacchaeus isn't a horrible guy, am I who I think I am? That's what he did with the woman at the well. She thought she was one thing. She thought she was someone. She thought she was a loose woman. She thought she was a gold digger. She thought that she was just looking for Mr. Right now. Mr. Whoever. And I've been saying that she went to the well and she was looking for Mr. Right, but she found truth. You see, finding out who you really are is the most important thing. After who Jesus is, finding out who you are is the most important thing you will ever discover. And what we learn is when we see Jesus face to face, we look different than we thought we did. We're not who we thought we were. We're not the same people we thought we were. In fact, you may say, I define myself this way. That's not even important to me anymore. I don't even care about that part of my identity. That's not who I am. But it matters. Because if you see yourself as God sees you, when your true identity is revealed, it changes everything. Many of your problems and my problems are because we don't know who we really are. Would you be different today if you could see yourself as God sees you? Duh. That's the answer. <laughs> Emphatically, yes, we would. But more importantly, we would see others differently because we do the same thing. We pigeonhole them by race, by color, by what they do for a living, by what nation they're from. And that's not who they are. Just like that musician said, that's not who I am. I'm not about what he said. I'm a totally different person than that. Let me tell you who I am. You see, who you are matters because if you don't know who you are, you may never know who Jesus is. He will reveal who you really are. In John, last week we were looking at verse 15. And they had had this encounter. And of course, a Samaritan woman being approached by a man from southern Israel was just out of the question that they would be together. And it was extremely forbidden, them, for, forbidden for them to even speak. And so they had this conversation about, you're a Samaritan man. I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you talking to me? Immediately, she goes to the identity, the nationality. And then she goes into... Uh, him being a man and her being a woman. She saw herself as a Samaritan woman. He says, what's your point? He said, 
If you knew who I was, you would ask me for something to drink, and I would give you living water. And the woman said to him, a very good question. Sir, give me this water so I will not be thirsty, nor come all the way here to draw, because that's what he promised. If I give you water, you won't have to come every day. It'll save you a lot of time, a lot of energy. He said to her, go call your husband. Now, what in the world kind of answer is that? You're just reading along, trying to enjoy the story. What, what did he say? Go, she wants living water, and you say, go call your husband? She's not defined by her husband. Why would Jesus want to do that? Why would he all of a sudden interject something about her husband into the conversation? Because he already knew what was going on in her private life. He already knew who her husband was. He said to her, go call your husband and come here. Come on back after you call your husband. And the woman answered and said, uh, I have no husband. Probably with a little bit of shame in her voice. This was not her proudest moment or the proudest area of her life, having had many different men. Jesus said to her, you have correctly said I have no husband, for you have had five husbands and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. She identified as a woman who was dependent upon men. That was her identity. Jesus wanted her to come face to face with that identity. He wanted her to look at it. He wanted her to look at how she viewed herself. This is not who she is. Keep this in mind. This is not who she really is. How, how can I say that? Because that's certainly accurate about her, is it not? He said, this is true. You have had five husbands and the one you got now is not your husband. He said, thus you have said, this you have said true. He's pointing out that's accurate. So if it's accurate, why isn't that who she is? Why isn't that part of her identity? Because if you ask me who I am, I'm going to say, well, I'm a father. Um, I've got two kids. I'm going to tell you about my two kids. Here's my wife, Jean. She's over here. He's like, no, who are you? Well, I'm defined by my family. I'm nobody without my family. I don't even want to be here without my family. But that's not who I am. And what Jesus said to her is, who are you? He got her to question how she viewed herself. You have a pretty low opinion of yourself, he could have said. You really need to reconsider how you see yourself. Because you're kind of dictated in this way the rest of your life. You may end up with 20 husbands at this rate. So Jesus got her to question who she is. Same thing he asked the crowd to do with Zacchaeus. Isn't that interesting? Isn't a tax collector, this is my friend. That's not, he's not who you think he is. This is a good man. He just doesn't know it. You see, when he gets next to me, he's going to figure it out. And Zacchaeus, all of a sudden, when he stood next to Jesus, what did he do? Something completely and totally out of character. He was standing in front of Jesus with the crowd looking on. And Zacchaeus said, half of all that I own. I'm going to sell and give the money to the poor. Half of it. And furthermore, if I've cheated any of these people, they can show up and I'll give it all back. Now, that's not who they thought he was. See, they were looking on and say, well, well, I thought that was Zacchaeus. What's he doing giving money away? Jesus said, because he's standing next to me, he get, he's starting to get the feeling that that's not who he is. He's starting to understand who he truly is. He is your brother, your sister, and he doesn't want your money. He doesn't want to take it from you. That's who he really is. He is a child of God. And if he's a child of God, so are you. You have the image of God on your heart. Jesus said, correctly, I have no husband, he said. You have said that correctly, for you have five husbands. He said the same thing to her. You're not who you think you are. Let me show you who you really are. And the revelation of her own identity 
revealed his true identity to her. She said, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Now, I'm not sure she understood what she was saying. She just said, this is a heavy moment for me because you know who I really am. You know me better than I know myself, obviously. And she says, I perceive something about you. She said, There's, you're not just a guy from Israel. You're not a guy from the southern kingdom. You are not a guy from Judea. Who are you? I perceive that you're a prophet. And Jesus answered her in the, another way that was not direct. Look at what Bar uh, William Barclay, who wrote some of the commentaries we've used in our Bible studies, he says this about the revelations in Scripture. He says, there are two revelations in Christianity, the revelation of God and the revelation of ourselves. No man ever really sees himself until he sees himself in the presence of Christ. We awake to ourselves and we awake to our need of God. You see, if you don't know that you need God, you don't know who you really are. You don't know who God created you to be. You don't know that you have a light within you waiting to burst forth because it, you are made in the image of God. You will never realize your full potential yeah. until you know Christ, until Jesus reveals who you are. And it's a process. You don't just instantly know like Zacchaeus did. Sometimes it takes years. But this revelation, when Jesus reveals himself to you and you say, Lord, I give my heart to you for the rest of your life, you're giving yourself to him. As you learn more, you give it back to him. Every day you learn something, give it to Jesus. It's your true identity that's being revealed to you. Today, we're going to look at three things. We're going to look that when we see ourselves as God sees us, we are called to worship. Just very clearly. When we see ourselves as God sees us, we go to our knees. True worshipers, secondly, are people who live and worship in spirit and in truth. And thirdly, Jesus offers the water of eternal life. So let's get back to first point. When we see ourselves as God sees us, we are called to worship. Uh, we understand this passage is generally the passage where we start when we're teaching about worship. Uh, the Psalms, of course, are, are places that we learn much about worship. But this passage in the New Testament tells us a lot about what worship is all about. Because immediately she says to him, I have some questions about worship. You see, Jesus reveals who she really is. She begins to understand who he is, and suddenly she wants to worship. She says, our fathers worshiped in this mountain. She was at the Jacob's well. And Jacob's well is at Mount Gerizim. Mount Gerizim is the kingdom's, the northern kingdom's uh, customary place of worship. You see, when the kingdom was divided, they changed some of history. You see, Abraham offered Isaac sacrifice on a different mountain. But for the northern kingdom, they couldn't go down to that mountain and worship. So they said, we will worship on Mount Gerizim. That's where Abraham sacrificed Isaac or offered Isaac as a sacrifice. That is the mountain where it really happened. They changed history. Yeah. So they could work in our new uh, uh, journalism today. <laughs> they could just change everything. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain. And you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where we ought to worship. This mountain, Mount Gerizim, is where we think we should worship. What she was really saying, what do you think she was saying? They're talking about identity and all of a sudden she changes the subject. Where can I worship? You would know. You know more than me. Is it right for me to worship here? Do I need to go to Jerusalem? Because you know something. I can tell. You have wisdom. You have knowledge. So tell me where I can worship. What was she really looking for? As Jesus opened up her heart, because that's what happened. He literally opened up. He, he asked a question in which she opened up her heart. When her true identity was revealed, 
it just kind of, you could hear the doors creaking open of her heart. And the first thing she wanted to do was to worship. And let me translate that for you. She wanted to find God. When you find out who you really are, you have a hunger for God. As your heart opens, you want to be healed. You want to pull up next to the Lord and walk with Him. You want to worship Him. So which mountain is it, Jesus? True worshipers are people who live and worship in spirit and truth, Jesus says to her. Woman, believe me, he says to her, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You see, even though her her heart was opening to God, she was still thinking in restrictions of, of where you were born and what nationality you were and what group you were with. Well, is are we right or are you right? Is this the place or do we need to go down there? And Jesus says, it's not about the place. You see, there's a day coming where everybody's going to realize it doesn't matter where you are, whether this mountain or that mountain. You worship what you do not know. Jesus immediately says, I'm inviting you to get to know God. And once you know God, you worship wherever you are. God goes with you. Wherever you are is a place of worship. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. Because he said that because Jews have always prided themselves on having the true place of worship in Jerusalem. They have the, the temple mount. They have uh, the, 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 the pure line of uh, uh, Jewish blood, whereas they had intermarried in Samaria. And so the, the, the bloodline was diluted. So all of this was factoring into her giving him superiority. And, and he says salvation is from the Jews. That's what you all think. But an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. Now, this is one of the most well-known passages in the scriptures. Those who worship will worship in spirit and in truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. We need to unpack this a little bit. The final uh, passage on this screen says, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So, I believe that what Jesus is saying to her, first you must understand who God is. He is spirit. He is not confined to a building. He is not restricted to the temple. Jesus could have been stoned for saying that alone. Jesus, had he said that in front of the Pharisees, said, God is not just in that temple. They would have said, I beg your pardon? He said, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So if God is spirit, what does that mean? It means that you can't see him, certainly, but it also means that we can dwell with him in our own spirit. In our own spirit, God can unite with us in intimacy. God is spirit. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit of truth. But what does the truth part mean? I believe that is what we bring. You have to be true. You have to come and not just know everything about God because God will teach you that. You see, we don't have to have perfect theology to become followers of Christ. In fact, you can be really messed up in your theology. God will straighten you out. Follow the word and you will be in truth. But I believe what this is about is you must come in truth without any pretense. That you must come exactly as you truly are. You must know who you really are and you must not hold anything back. You must not be like Adam and try to hide it somewhere in the garden. 
looking for a fig leaf, looking for a, a, some kind of structure to cover himself because he's ashamed. We are to come as we are, come just as you are and hold nothing back. This God is who I understand myself to be. God said, well, we'll start with that. But that's not who you really are. You're going to learn who you really are if you stay with me. If you walk with me, you're going to learn more every day about your true identity. You know, I've talked before about my father being a uh, guy that really was into genealogy. You know what that means? It means you don't want to be anywhere near my dad when he got you in a confined space. <laughs> Because he will tell you all about genealogy. He won first place at the Oklahoma State Fair in sometime in the 80s. I didn't even know they had genealogy competitions. But he had all his books lined up in a row and had everything uh, in those little plastic sheet protectors and all his binders. And they were all perfectly aligned. And he had all the way back to the 1600s. He had done all this work for decades. He had worked so hard. He had traveled all over the, the country looking for records. We have the original um, copies of the original uh, uh uh, deed that came from when they were made the land run, the initial granting of the property, and then, then when they were given full ownership of the property after they improved it. We've got all that original stuff because my dad was such a nerd. And he tried and tried to get me interested. He tried so hard, and I was just like, oh. Oh. it was just like sticking needles in my eyes when he was talking about genealogy. It was just like so painful. My wife and I would both go, He's got the genealogy notebook. Oh. But there's really some amazing stuff in there. You can find out exactly where you're from, your heritage. And I've told this story before, but when I got to, when I got to uh, Virginia, I had dinner. I was invited to speak at a WMU luncheon. And this church was what I would call a country club church. It was a good church. It was a solid church. But... Very wealthy people in the church. Very, uh, a lot of old money in the church. I called it a country club church. And I was invited to speak at the WMU luncheon. And we were around a formal table with about 20 place settings in this big house. And this old, blue-blooded, blue-haired lady from Virginia, from Southern Virginia. And she talked like this. She said, hello, it's good to have you with us today, Pastor. We are looking forward to you talking, but we want to have some lunch first. And I'll go in there, and it's one of those things where you have to use the right utensil at the right time. And so I just sat there until I saw what everybody else did, because I was never trained. And I got to talking to this lady right next to me. She says, I wanted to have you here today because I understand that you have roots in Virginia. I said, well, yes. In fact, I, I did mention that to the pastor that my original ancestors came and lived in Virginia. She said, well... Most people did, actually. Virginia was the most uh, uh, prosperous of all the colonies. And it wasn't the original colony, but the most prosperous of the southern states and closest to the seat of power. And she was explaining to me why Virginia was all that. She says, well, tell me, how did your ancestors come to the United States? And I said, well, they came to the colonies in the 1600s. I said, my, my ancestor was this name. I actually knew the name at the time. I forget who it is now. And had the last name Hatchet. And he came as an indentured servant. And she said, oh. <laughs> And I said, however, he became a man of property. She said, oh. <clears throat> he became a man of property because he married the daughter of his master. He became a property owner, a landowner. He became a wealthy man because he married into the family which was very unusual for a, an indentured servant to be accepted into a wealthy family, but he was. And she said, oh, well, I'm glad to tell you that you might qualify for the FFV. And I said, what's the FFV? She said, that's the first families of Virginia. <laughs> I said, oh, wow. Just what I've always wanted. <laughs> Membership in the FFV. Do they get discounts at a motel? I don't know. That's all I care about. And she said, well, sir, tell me what happened to your family after that. Well, then uh, the family eventually moved west. Uh, they settled in 
the, they found more land in uh, Kentucky and Tennessee. She said, oh. <laughs> some of them stayed behind. Some of the kids stayed behind, but some went. And she said, okay, well, that's all right. And then some of them, after that, in the 1800s, migrated to Missouri. Oh, on the frontier. Okay. And then what happened to your family? Well, then my great-grandfather made the land run in 1896 into the Oklahoma Territory. She said, oh. Well, I'm afraid you do understand, do you not, that Oklahoma is the Australia of the United States. <laughs> and I was sitting there processing what she said. I think she just insulted my family is what I think she just did. I think so. And everybody else from Oklahoma. And I wanted to stand up and say, well, your football team stinks. You never win, Virginia Cavalier. <laughs> And I sat there and realized that she had just defined me down to an oaky, because that's where my family was from. And she got more and more disappointed the farther west we got. And I started thinking, man, I could have been in the first families of Virginia if they'd have just stayed put. <laughs> but of course I couldn't care less about the first families of Virginia. In fact, I had really bad taste in my mouth when I left that day, how I had been defined down to where I grew up. Well, who am I? I'm kind of proud to be an Oki. I talk about it all the time. I don't hide it. I'm not moving back. <laughs> but I'm from Oklahoma. Is that who I am? You see, it's not where I go. It's not even what I do. It's who I am that matters. Because wherever I go and whatever I do, I am still a follower of Christ. My identity is a child of God. It is not an Okie. It is not a Virginian. And she's going to get up to heaven and she says, but I was in the FFV. Don't you have a lodger house? <laughs> That's not who you are. That is not who you are. In fact, it doesn't even matter in heaven where you're from. It doesn't matter what family you're from. What matters is who you are to God. And that's what Jesus said here. When you worship God in spirit and truth, you are worshiping God as he is spirit. And you are worshiping God as you are truth. The truth of who you are. Not the baloney, not the image, not the persona, not the ego. You are not an employee of this company. You are a child of God. That's your identity. Don't ever let anybody else tell you something else. It is always you are a child of God before anything else. In fact, it won't even matter that you're American. I know that's hard to believe. Yeah, I know. We're all, I'm proud to be an American. Not in heaven, you won't be. You won't care. I can't hang the American flag outside my mansion in heaven. No. There won't be an American flag. There won't be an Oklahoma flag. There won't be an Oregon flag. Heck, you can't even hang a University of Oregon flag or a Seahawks flag outside your mansion. Because that's not who you are. You are a child of God. You are a member of the family of God. That's your identity. And who you are means everything when you're talking about the word of God. Because to come and to worship God, you've got to come to worship in spirit. And then you've got to bring the truth about who you are. And nothing else matters. You realize I've worshipped in total falsehood from time to time. Because I felt differently about myself than who I really was. I've worshipped in total falsehood thinking... Well, I'm a pastor. No, I'm not. I'm a child of God. I'm not even a worship leader. I'm a child of God. That's who I am. I have worshipped in falsehood saying, oh, I've been a sinner this week. No, you're a child of God. Grace covered and forgiven. You are a child of God. You're not a sinner. That is not who you are. How many Christians live as sinners the rest of their lives, even though grace has covered them? We live as sinners saying, woe is me. I sure am 
terrible at this Christian life thing. I'm doing something wrong. God says, that's not who you are. You're not a sinner. Stop lying about who you are. Come in truth. You are a child of God. And go your way and sin no more. You see, your life is not going to work when you try to live as someone else. Your spiritual life will grow stagnant, stale, and stuck, and you won't advance at all unless you live as you really are, a child of God, a worshiper of spirit in truth. You are worshiping in truth the greatest spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, and God dwells within you, so you don't have to go to any special place. Now, granted, if you go with me to Eagle Cap, worship gets easier. (laughs) When I took Frank's grandson up to a place the other day, I was a little disappointed because I tried to take Tamarius. Uh, We wanted to go up. I wanted to take him. He said, I want to go fishing. I said, well, we'll go up to one of my favorite lakes. But then I found out you have to have reservations now to get into all my favorite places. And I'm just not good enough. I try to get reservations. They got some kind of thing going on where I can't get a reservation. It's just, I'm kind of, I may never get back up there. I tried all summer to get reservations, couldn't do it. So I had to go someplace else. So I called my friend Danny and Danny said, you know, I went into this lake over here the other day and there's some brown trout in there. There's some, you might catch some fish there. And we, I said, okay, it's on the McKenzie Pass. So we went up and over the McKenzie Pass and down. It's about an hour and 45 minutes away, a little farther than I wanted to go. That's Okay. I took him in for an overnight backpacking trip. We put our packs on. We set up a camp when we got to the lake. It was only a couple miles in. It wasn't that bad. And we were down at the lake, and I heard something coming from up the mountain. And I said, what's that? I think that sounds like a waterfall up there. I hear a roar. That's not just a creek. Tomorrow morning, let's go up the hill. You up for that? And he says, yeah, let's go. And we got up there, and... We started hiking up. There wasn't much of a trail, just a little goat trail. And we, and we come through the trees and behold, there's a hundred foot waterfall sitting right in front of us. And I said, where did that come from? A waterfall, a beautiful waterfall. Just one of the most pretty waterfalls you ever see. You know, you see pictures of Multnomah Falls and everything. Nobody goes up to this one because it's kind of hard. It's up a steep thing. There's no trail to it. So it's kind of hard to get to my kind of place. <laughs> Nobody was there. And I said, let's go to the top of this one. And I looked up above the top of that one after we hiked around and got up there and climbed. And there was another one. It was about 150 feet high. It had five tiers to it. One, two, 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 two. I should have, put, should have put pictures up of it. It was just beautiful, stunning, gorgeous place. And so I said, hey, let's get closer. He says, is it safe? I said, probably not. Let's go. <laughs> And he says, now you be careful. I got some people in North Carolina. They're kind of like gangsters. If anything happens to me, they'll all be up here looking for you. (laughs) And we went over right next to the waterfall. And we got down there and the mist was spraying up and it was just beautiful. And he was just overwhelmed. He says, this is just amazing. I've never seen anything like this. He grew up in Kenosha, Wisconsin. He says, I've never seen anything like this. This is incredible. I said, well, I've seen something like it, but I love this. It's beautiful. And just the spirit of worship that overwhelmed us was amazing. Tamaria said, I'm glad I'm here with the preacher because this feels like worship. I said, well, you don't have to be here with the preacher to worship. In fact, sometimes it quenches the spirit. (laughs) But we just sat there in a spirit of worship for a good 45 minutes to an hour, just sitting there enjoying the beauty of that place. Now that just overwhelmed us. We didn't have to work to worship. It was easy. But you can do that anywhere because the presence of God is a million times more incredible than any waterfall you could ever see. Any vision that you could ever have, the presence of God can drop you to your knees if you worship in spirit and in truth. You see the difference between worshiping in spirit. You go and you worship God in spirit. We do that, right? That's not too hard. We go to worship in spirit. We say, we know God's spirit. I'll try to open my heart and get in touch with his spirit, with my spirit. But are you coming in truth? When you come in spirit and in truth, worship just works. It just flows out of us and it overwhelms us. The beauty of worship. 
is amazing. Jesus goes on to tell a little bit more about worshiping in spirit and truth. The Samaritan really wanted to know, where can I find God? And Jesus replied, everywhere. Anywhere you want, you can find him. Because he's spirit. It's not this mountain. It's not that mountain. Everybody's going to learn that soon. Because we're going to be plumb run out of Jerusalem here in about 50 years. <laughs> and we can't even, we won't even have a temple to worship at. So we're going to find that if God is in the temple, we're out of luck. And what they found was God wasn't just in the temple. God is spirit and truth. Barclay goes on to say a few pages after that first quote that I read you, true worship is when man through his spirit attains to friendship and intimacy with God. That's true worship. When we can truly understand who God is and who we are, that God loves us as we are. He's already forgiven the grace by grace. He's already forgiven the sin and we're not perfect. Don't you want to wait till you look better? Right? Jeannie's mother, bless her heart. We have so few pictures of her. You know why? Every picture is her going. She didn't want anybody to see her. She didn't want to take a picture. No, no, no. So when Jeannie tries to do that, I say, just smile. <laughs> because we are who we are. But we want to wait till we look better. And God says, don't wait. You'll miss out. Come as you are in spirit and in truth. Worship God in spirit and come in truth. That's how you can worship today. Final point. The true identity of Jesus will lead you to your own true identity. You see, the woman was thinking maybe he's a prophet. Maybe he's just a smart teacher. Maybe he's a, 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 a really wise uh, man who's just wandering the, the countryside because he doesn't fit any of the descriptions of any of those kind of guys that I've seen before. And the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. He who is called Christ. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us. Now, they had this knowledge. It was in the scriptures. It was foretold in Isaiah that Messiah is coming. It was foretold that the Messiah would come and would restore the kingdom and would declare truth to whole nation. And she said, I may be Samaritan, but I'm still holding out hope for the Messiah because I know he's coming. And I don't know why, but I feel that I just need to talk to you about that. Messiah is coming and he's going to he's going to he's going to reveal everything to us. And Jesus said, you figured it out. That's me. I am he. I who speak to you am he. I'm not a good teacher. I'm not a wise man. I'm not a religious leader. I'm the son of God. Come to take away the sin of the world. The woman came looking for Mr. Right. And she found Jesus. The truth. The way, the truth, and the life. I who speak to you am he. Do you see how much Jesus wrapped his identity and her identity into this story, into the way that he communicated with her? Everything was about who you think you are. I try to remember this now when I'm talking to people about the Lord. This guy doesn't know that he really is a child of God. He says, I'm a good guy. I said, oh, that's not the half of it. Well, I, I, I do a few things wrong, but I, I help people. I give to the poor occasionally. I gave a dollar just the other day on the corner. Um, I'm a pretty good guy. I said, well, that's not who you are. That's what you did. Who are you? Well, I'm a husband. No, who are you? Who are you? Are you a tax collector? Is that how you think of yourself? Because if you're not going to answer with God is my father, then you're going to get it wrong. You are a child of God. And what remains, to, what you will look like on this earth remains to be seen. You're, de, you're still developing. You're like a picture that is still developing. Don't peel it off yet. We want to wait till the end. But God says, come as you are. And we'll work on it together. 
As you walk with God, who you are becomes clear. Your true identity will be revealed and you will see Jesus. Jesus' true identity will lead to your total identity. So what have you believed about yourself? Have you believed that you were just a mediocre underachiever? Were you smarter than you let everybody know? Do you feel dumber than everybody thinks you are? Do you feel uglier than you really are? Are you waiting for something to change in your life? Or are you waiting to discover who Jesus really is so that you can know who you really are? Let's pray. God, reveal to us today who we really are in Christ. We are your children. We are your unblemished, spotless lambs who have been washed by the blood of the Lamb. We are grateful for that grace, that mercy, that forgiveness. We have available to us the power of the Holy Spirit, and yet we seem satisfied with the power of a remote control. Release in us the bondage of those false views of ourselves, the false image of ourselves, the false ego, the false narrative of our own lives. Allow us to overcome who we thought we were to become who we truly are in Jesus. Transformation, Lord, is not just a slogan. It is the truth of our existence on this earth that you are transforming us daily. As you have already transformed our hearts, you are transforming us into your perfect children. And when we see your son, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. We thank you, Father, for the transformation process that is ongoing, but don't let us wait until the end before we choose to bring all of who we are to you to become who you want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. We thank you for joining us online, and we hope that uh, you've had a blessed experience in this worship time. Uh, contact us if we can be of any assistance to you this week. And please uh, uh, join us next week for... Uh, Another part in this series on uh, the new heart. <laughs>